This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory be to thee, O Christ. This is Luke chapter 14, beginning at the 25th verse. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Boy, did you listen to the words of this gospel lesson? Um, Jesus uh, has these large crowds of people who are coming after him to follow him. And Jesus says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Well, that's, I mean, do you expect Jesus to say those kinds of words? And we don't expect Jesus to, to tell people that they have to hate uh, people who are the closest to them in order to be one of his disciples. Uh, we, you know, we think of Jesus as the one who brings love, who brings um, unity, who brings um, healing of relationships. Uh, how could it be that Jesus would say um, uh, you know, that, that you need to, uh, to hate the people who are closest to you? Uh, it seems so strange. Uh, it certainly is not, uh, even in the Old Testament, uh, you know, one of the commandments is to honor your father and your mother, uh, certainly not to hate them. Uh, and so what is it that Jesus is getting at? How is it that it's possible? Well, uh, in, a, in a, um, a, a similar passage in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew maybe helps us out a little bit. Um, he's saying, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Uh, well, that gets us a little bit um, closer, doesn't it? Uh, so it's not about hating. Um, Jesus is exaggerating to get the attention of the people. He's making a point for them. Uh, but so in this, in this gospel lesson, it's, it's comparative. It is anyone who does not love me more than father or mother or sister or brother um, is not worthy of me. It cannot be my disciple. Um, so there's a comparative piece here uh, to love Jesus more. Uh, but even then, it's not easy, is it? Uh, you couldn't put those words on the lips of anybody. I mean, we've got two presidential candidates who have egos as big as the world. But you can't, you can't imagine them saying, if anyone uh, lo doesn't love me more than your father, mother, sister, brother, um, they can't be, they can't come and vote for me. I mean, you can't imagine them getting away with that. Uh, there is still this, this absolute command on the part of Jesus to be able to give up everything in order to be able to somehow come and follow him. Uh, how is it that we can, uh, that we can kind of come to be able to understand that? Um, well, do you have a hobby? Do you have a hobby? Oh, there are lots of hobbies. Hobbies are great, aren't they? Um, so hobbies are, I, when I was a kid, I put together little model cars, you know, little plastic things and glued them together. Um, people have all kinds of, of hobbies about um, gardening and horticulture, fishing, uh, uh, stamp collecting, and baseball cards. Um, lots of different kinds of hobbies. And hobbies are great because uh, they take as much time as you want to give them. Uh, they dem don't demand any expertise on your part. You just do it because you enjoy it. If it gets hard, then you kind of move on to something else. 
Uh, there's, there's no real accountability uh, for a hobby. Uh, you do it because it's fun, and if it's not fun, you don't do it anymore. Um, that works really great for, uh, for things like uh, stamp collecting and gardening and, and things that we enjoy. Um, but it doesn't work well when it comes to uh, the, the most important relationships in our life. So, for instance, if you said, uh, as, or someone said about their marriage, um, um, oh, you know, this is my husband and wife, uh, or wife, and, uh, and they're my hobby. You know, I, I spend time with them when it feels good, and, and if things get a little complicated or hard, then I go find something else, or I just set them aside for a while and go do something else, right? Or uh, if, uh, if a parent says, um, yeah, we decided we're going to have a kid, but that's just because we need a hobby. We need something, we're too bored, you know, so we need something to kind of keep us busy, you know, in the, in the down times of our lives. But, but we know that, uh, that uh, when things, if things get a little dicey or difficult, um, you know, we'll just move on, do something else. Well, when you get to the core relationships, things that really matter, uh, the idea of being a hobby doesn't help us. It doesn't get us to the heart. In fact, it says something about our character, about the kinds of people that we are. And that certainly is true about our faith with Christ. Um, sometimes we're tempted to treat our faith in Christ as a hobby, uh, something that we do as long as we enjoy it. Uh, we can do, attend to it as long as we have time. If it gets a little dicey or complicated, then we just kind of set it aside and we move on to something else. Uh, but Jesus uh, is inviting us to see, no, this is, the, this is the foundational relationship of our life. And so it changes all of the other relationships in our life. So we like uh, to be able to come to church and to be able to look up at the cross and to be able to say, you know, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for the grace and mercy that you've given to us uh, and the forgiveness of, of all that we've done and that you love us. And so thanks be to God, and we like to be able to kind of then go on our way, right? But in the lesson today, you know, Jesus kind of, as we're turning, Jesus kind of taps us on the shoulder. And he says, well, uh, wait just a minute. Uh, there's another cross here. And that cross has your name on it. And so you need to pick up that cross and follow me if you're going to be my disciple. And you know, a cross is not just a, a nice symbol to put on an earring or a, or a necklace, uh, but it's a symbol of death. It's a symbol of the end of our life and a willingness to follow Jesus on his way to Golgotha, to the cross. Well, wow. I mean, that's really, that's really harsh. That's really tough. Well, so why would Jesus, I mean, it certainly is not good public relations for Jesus to talk in this way. So why would Jesus make such an exclusive demand for us? It seems like such a downer. Well, maybe it's because it's the only way that he can save us. It is only, it is only by coming to the end of our life. It's only by loving him more than anything else. It's only by picking up our cross and follow him that he can actually save us, that he can actually transform our lives and bring us healing and health. And as we recognize that, then, then finally we've discovered the, the path of wisdom. It's like I was remembering on this uh, Labor Day weekend, uh, the first time my wife uh, went into labor. I know that Labor Day weekend is about work and labor, labor unions and all of those kinds of things. But when my wife went into labor, I worked a lot. That was a tough time. Um, but she, was, uh, she went into labor with our first kid. Uh, his name was Daniel. And, uh, and he was big. Uh, she was about two weeks after her due date. Um, he, the, he was uh, almost 11 pounds inside of her. And he was breech, that meaning he was upside down. So there was no way that he was going to be coming out the way God originally intended for babies to come out. And so he was going to be born by cesarean section. And so I remember her being on the gurney. We were rolling uh, her down the, down the aisle, down the hall, and into the, uh, into the operating room, the delivery room, um, where he would be born. And they let me come in, uh, and she was laying there, um, and her 
belly was exposed, she had surgical towels kind of all around her, and I sat there um, right next to, uh, next to her during the surgery. Uh, but imagine if the surgeon came to me as he walked into the room and he said, uh, Mr. Cedarberg, he said, I've only just met you uh, and, uh, and just known your wife for just a very little time. You know her better than I do, and you love her um, certainly more than I do. She's just a patient of mine. Um, but uh, since you have such deep care and concern for her, here, and he hands me the scalpel, why don't you do the surgery? Well, <laughs> I suppose I could say, well, yeah, I can do this. You know, what, what could be so hard about this? You know, I love her. I've cared, I cared for her. I've done all kinds of things. I've seen her through. Yeah, I ought to be the one to take care of this, don't you think? Well, I think if Darla had not been so sedated, she would be rather shocked <laughs> at that idea. Um, wouldn't the right answer be, no, 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 <laughs> I don't want it. I don't know what I'm doing. That's, I'm, it's outside my field of confidence. Here, you do it. You take care of this. And those are words of wisdom, aren't they? In that situation, but in every situation, as it deals with the relationships and the things that are the most important to us. Jesus comes to us as the one who offers to us life for anything we put into his hands. And so our spouses, our most critical family relationships, our children, the possessions that we have, our investment portfolios, our businesses, our careers, all of those things that are precious to us we have this opportunity to be able to say, Lord Jesus, I haven't got a clue. Don't give them to me. You take them. Take them out of my hands and heal them and touch them and fill them and use them. Because anything we put into his hands is going to be safe and secure, cared for by him. And so then he receives them from our hands. And he blows his Holy Spirit on them. And then he looks back to us and he says, here, take them. Uh, uh, don't just grab them. Take them. Take them. But let me now teach you how to steward these relationships. How to steward these things. Not out of the anxiety and the brokenness in your own hearts, but out of the love that I have for you. Because these people and things, these are precious. And it has to do with the work of your life. So don't ruin it. Don't lose it. Don't, don't let your own ego or insecurity somehow distort them. Let me teach you how to take care of them. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he gave his disciples a command. He said, love one another as I have loved you. Don't love one another as your mom and dad did. Don't love one another as you think is best in this present moment. Love one another as I have loved you. It is as you love one another that people will know that you are my disciples. And so this opportunity gradually to receive from him this this tutelage, this training, this teaching about how to be the kind of people that Jesus has called us to be in each of these critical, important relationships in our lives and to receive them back. Jesus says at the, at the, in the very last sentence of the gospel lesson, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything cannot be my disciples. Well, it's because if we don't give it up, we can't be his disciples. We can't because he hasn't been able to take control of them and to teach us and to show us how to be able to use them. It is as we surrender things into his hands that, that finally we are freed up from all of the anxiety and all of the worry and all of the confusion that life throws at us. We are able to trust him that his hands are good and strong and mighty and healing and forgiven, forgiving and compassionate. Jim Elliot, the great uh, 
the great Christian missionary, said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. It's the truth of the Christian life, and it's the invitation that Jesus gives to us, even just this moment, right now, to be able to surrender everything that we have, even our own bodies, our own lives, into his hands. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, in this world, uh, we grasp at things. We grasp at relationships that are closest to us. We grasp at our possessions, our money, our portfolios. We grasp at our careers. We grasp at political power. We grasp coming out of our own anxiety and our worry and our fears and our greed. And yet, Lord Jesus, you give to us this, this opportunity to surrender everything, our own lives, Lord Jesus, into your hands. And so we do that right now. We surrender ourselves into your hands. We pray that whatever it is that happens to us, we'll trust you. We'll allow you to take care of us. And we'll look to you to be able to teach us how it is that we can walk and how it is that we can treat one another. Because you are the Lord of life. And it is as we give ourselves to you that we experience your blessings both in this world and in the next. Be with us, Lord Jesus. Teach us and use us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.